Um, so I'm Gary Lau. I'm one of the consultants at Glenfield. I do cardiac and intensive care here at Glenfield Hospital. I'm going to talk about critical care echo. Actually, I'm, what I'm going to do is try and de demystify critical care echo because apparently lots of people do it. Everyone does it differently and can be really confusing. And so for those uh, for those that don't me, know me, um, I was born and raised in Toronto. I went back a decade ago for my cardiac fellowship and where where I was trained in Toronto, they taught me critical care echo and I've been running courses since coming back to the UK. Um, as a trainee, I showed my prowess in collecting trophies and I collected pretty much all the echo accreditations you could do at the time. And at the moment, I'm a, the supervisor and mentor for almost every basic, intermediate or advanced echo accreditation available. So if you need a supervisor for any sort of uh, ultrasound based accreditation, just contact me by email and I'll, and I'll try and uh, sort something out with you. Um, the other thing is I'm one of the top three trainers for accrediting people for FICE in the UK. So essentially I eat, sleep and breathe echo. So here are the objectives today. What I'm not going to teach you is focus echo um, because I think it's impossible to teach anyone to a level that would be useful to you in 30 minutes let alone teach you a hands-on skill remotely. I'm also conscious that probably there are many of you at various different stages of your ECHO experience. So if you want to learn basic ECHO, I would encourage you to attend a course, uh, well, particularly mine, but what we're going to do is go through a whistle-stop tour of where critical care ECHO is now and where we're going to head in the next, uh, in the next sort of five to 10 years. Also, in the latter part of the presentation, I will try and show you how I use echo in my clinical practice, which might be very different from lots of other people. Um, so in terms of critical care, what is critical care echo? And this definition of critical care echo is probably the most pragmatic definition I've seen. Uh, in critical care echo, um, it puts the tool in the hands of the intensivist, and this is unique in that um, the person that's taking care of the patient is performing the investigation and also using those echo findings to help guide the patient management. So the boundaries of critical care echo are changing all the time and there have been a lot, huge number of changes in the last 24 to 36 months and many things haven't been released, have been released without a huge amount of advertising, mainly because of uh, mainly because of COVID. So back in the day, probably uh, over 10 years ago, the only thing that was available in critical care was the level two BSE accreditations in TOE, transthoracic and critical care. Um, in 2012, BICE was born, which was a collaboration between the ICS and the BSC. In 2018, the BSC released the level one accreditation for cardiology registrars, and that's purely in reality action in my view to the NHS pledge for seven day services, services for cardiac imaging. At the same time, the cardiology registrars were not required to do a BSC level two accreditation because the practice in cardiology has been sub uh, been subspecializing over the last few years. And really only the only ones that do any imaging are actually the imaging cardiologists. Um, around Around 2020, I think Vice became Fuse of Heart as a rebranding exercise, and they, and they also released Fusic HD or hemodynamics at the SOA. I think at, at the SOA in 2020. Um, so lots of change over the last five to ten years. Also outside the UK, the Europeans created EDEC, which is a combination of TOE and transthoracic echo, and they labeled this as a intermediate accreditation. Um, but actually the number of located, the, the, sorry, the modalities they use is probably at the level of the advanced user, but the number of log book cases required is at the level of the intermediate accreditations. So I'm pretty sure you're all confused about what, what to do, but in reality, the take home point is I don't think anyone needs to do critical care uh, echo at the level two accreditation level, uh, because literally it will take two years out of your life and what we should really be aiming for is that it, most of us should be aiming for immediate intermediate accreditation. And the reason for that is that something like for FUSIC HD or EDIC, it really gives you enough firepower to make qualitative or quantitative critical care assessments of the RV function, LV function, bowel disorders, mainly left-sided, 
you can assess cardiac output, you can also assess your PA systolic pressure, RV systolic pressure, and assess for pulmonary hypertension. And basically, that encompass, uh, encompasses 94% of your clinical care practice. And uh, in reality, I, I rarely do a full level two scan unless I'm not sure about what the diagnosis is. And so also performing echo, technically performing echo is actually the straightforward bit. It's, the technical, it's a technical skill that needs practice and there is a specific data set for every level. But how you use the information, the echo to apply to patient management is the difficult bit. And there's really three sort of key points I would, I would say when you're doing echo or trying to use echo in your clinical practices. Number one, there can be huge inter-observer variation. Number two, don't rely on the echo report. If in doubt, repeat it. And clinical correlation is essential. And so let's see some examples of what I'm talking about. Um, I think uh, MS Teams doesn't image, uh, does, doesn't transmit echo images, which is really good. So the images are pretty, probably a bit choppy. Uh, but we know as supervisors, there is a huge variability in echo interpretation as critical care echo is a new modality. We know also that many people might be practicing unsupervised and it's the situation is not like in cardiology where all the reports are authorized by a consultant or a senior sonographer. And so this is an echo loop that I have in one of my courses. I've asked this question for over a decade. What do you think about the function of this heart? And the allowed answers are quite binary if you see on the top right. Uh, is, the, is the RV bad? Is the LV bad? Is the LV okay? Is there preserved systolic function? Or do you want to sit on the fence and say, yeah, I can't, I can't make an assessment? And so the correct answer would be the LV is actually preserved. You have the LV is actually not bad function. Okay. And but this is the spread of answers I get from novices. And I suspect a lot of these people go back to the hospital, make patient management plans using echo. And this is a potentially a dangerous issue, but actually most of us are quite cautious and, the, and risk averse, so the, 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 the risk is actually quite low. But the good news is that like with anything, the more experience you get, the better you get at interpreting the echo, but make, make sure you've got a good mentor or supervisor to hone your skills. Um, the other one, the, uh, the, my second piece of advice is that you should always repeat the echo. In this trust, you can't see echo loops un unless you have specific access. In fact, if you have a patient coming from a different hospital, you definitely don't have access to echo loops, just a report. So actually, it's probably best to repeat the echo as a baseline. And there's a this case study is a, it shows what's an example of this, really. We get cases like this infrequently where the echo doesn't really match the report. For example, this gentleman came to us uh, under the SARF service, 49-year-old gentleman, presented with five days history of shortness of breath and non-specific symptoms at a transthoracic at the referring hospital, which is a cardiac center, which, which the report says mild chronic MR. And he was admitted to Glenfields for SARP assessment for the consideration of ECMO. So this is typical chest x-ray for a SARP patient, so bilateral, quite bad bilateral infiltrates, but the patient wasn't getting better with the usual SARP management. It kept them dry, long protective ventilation, proned him, uh, but when we put him on his back, we did a TOE. And this is what it shows. OK, so this is a TOE picture. So you can see the echo probe is at the back of the heart. So for those who are familiar with transthoracic echo, this is equivalent of your sort of apical four, uh, apical four chamber view, uh, except that the image is flipped. All right. But you can see the mitral valve is clearly abnormal. The tips of the leaflet aren't really matching each other when it when the when the uh, uh, valve is closed, and part of the leaflet, which is this posterior part of the leaflet, is actually prolapsing the left atrium. We put color flow on it. You can see there's there's a severe jet of mitral regurgitation without even doing any measurements. You can set, you can tell it's severe and it's significant. So this patient underwent a mitral valve repair where they cut out a bit of prolapsing valve, and you can see actually the regurgitation. Uh, and they put a ring about it, and you can see the regurgitation is is pretty much gone. From the chest X-ray, you can see you know there's a difference of about 24, 36 hours between the two chest X-rays. This patient fortunately avoided ECMO, got the right therapy, and got discharged back to the referring hospital. And it's always useful to re-echo the patient, as not only the echo report might not match the presentation. More commonly, actually, the hemodynamics may have changed. So someone may have instituted treatment at their hospital. The heart's either gotten better or gotten worse since you since the first echo. 
So the other reason to repeat the echo is that if you're looking at a standard set of limited 2D images, you're, you're basically looking at 2D images to make an interpretation of the 3D structure. So what if you do see anything abnormal, you, you need to scan another window to get a true understanding of what you see is actually there. Uh, and finally, remember when you're asked to scan a patient, get a history so you can correlate the findings to the patient presentation. And it's similar to the radio when to when the radiology report comes back as clinical correlation is recommended, which basically translates to the radiologist saying to you, you haven't given me enough clinical information to interpret the scan. So first of all, looking at this image is a 2D image. So sorry, 2D, two chamber view of the heart in the A in the window of the apical uh, four chamber. So the difference is that we've rotated the probe to 90 degrees. Oh shoot. But we rotated the probe to 90 degrees where this is the anterior wall, this is the posterior wall. And what's that thing there? So what's the arrow red, uh, what's the uh, structure the red arrow is pointing at? Is it endocarditis, is it a thrombus, a rupture, or some sort of native cardiac, uh, um, or um, some um, a tumor, a cardiac tumor? So without a history, you, you really have no idea. If I told you that this patient is 54, presented to the hospital with one day histories of shortness of breath after having a primary PCI to his RCA for MI seven days ago, this makes the diagnosis much more clear and it's most likely he's ruptured his posterior popular, popular muscle. And you can see actually where the papillary muscle should have been attached to the posterior wall. So those are the three big tips I can offer when you use critical care echo in your practice. So as I said before, there have been quite a few changes in echo training. There have been some changes happening now or in the near future. The big one was released in December, uh, December last year at the SOA. And they've released a new module in the FUSIC, um, um, FUSIC uh, ultrasound training uh, accreditation, which is focused TOE. OK, we know that TOE produces far superior images, um, despite, even despite developments of imaging technology and transthoracic echo and the development of 3D transthoracic probes. So I know you're what you're thinking. TOE, we are doing cardiac, but actually our patients are probably the best ones for this modality as quite few of our patients are either post-surgical, they're really big or have underlying chronic lung disease, which makes transthoracic imaging very difficult. It is semi-invasive, but not as invasive as some of the other options we have for cardiac monitoring. And we actually use it quite regularly in non-cardiac surgery in Glenfield, such as in big vascular cases or thoracics to assess RV function prior to proceeding to a pneumonectomy. The other thing I want to touch on is the ultra-portable ultra ultrasounds and echo device market. So over the last five years, I think I've seen a lot more of these, uh, more of these devices, actually people actually purchasing it privately to for for clinical use really um, and some people actually have actually replaced the cesspool with the ultrasound probe because the reason is why would you listen to heart and lungs when you can't when you can see them which does make sense but the difference is that we've, we've been trained for decades how to listen to heart and lungs and some people have just started scanning hearts and lungs in the past year so it, it will take a, quite a long time to actually get to a level where where um, you're you're more uh, you're actually proficient at assessing the heart and lungs. Okay, so we're actually moving towards the realm of personal ultrasound and POCUS ultrasound, where we literally take a device out of our pocket and scan the patient in non-clinical care areas. Um, so, this one. Um, so. These small echo devices are really good for their size. The benefit is obviously their portability and connectivity, but you really lose image quality the smaller the device gets. As you can compare the left to the right, the right side is, is much poor resolution than the left one, which is one of the sort of the theater machines that we use at Glenfield, okay? But if you're learning how to do echo, then you really should get the best machine you can get. Otherwise, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage, really. And I think that also these personal echo devices are gimmicky like mo mo mobile phones. There was a trend that we had ultra small portable mobile phones and now mobile phones are getting bigger and bigger. And the same will happen with echo machines as demand of higher resolution and higher frame rate devices are, uh, and more people start to learn echo. And the other 
topic I, I want to touch about is artificial intelligence. There's a big drive to try and get artificial intelligence. I mean, uh, at the moment, I don't think we're anywhere close to being using uh, artificial intelligence in ECHO. We can't even get the artificial intelligence to look at the ECG properly, really. So I think we're probably at least five to 10 years away from actually using it uh, to, to uh, diagnose uh, cardiac problems. So the question is, how do we use or how useful is ECHO in critical care? And back in the day when ECHO was released to critical care, uh, they used to say it was great for various critical care conditions, such as those with cardiovascular and respiratory compromise, to distinguish between cardiac and lung conditions, the cardiac arrest patient, as well as making decisions during CPR. And also, also they said that echo can use, we can use echo to potentially diagnose reversible conditions such as PE. We can use it to assess fluid status and as well as the filling of the heart. But if you look at the evidence, this isn't always the case. Okay. So this is probably where we are now in terms of usefulness of echo on these specific conditions that I've talked about. There's also clear evidence that echo is good for these conditions in the green box, and I won't even touch upon this. But what I'm going to focus on is the two things I most often get asked about echo outside of assessing patients with hemodynamic compromise. One is diagnosing P, and the other is assessing fluid status and LV diastolic function. <clears throat> So, the reality is with PE, unless you visualize the thrombus, you can't diagnose a PE. And it's really never easy as, as this. So, this is a mid esophageal view of the ascending order in the short axis. So, it's a TOE image where the probe is behind the heart and your ascending aorta is a circle in the middle. Your SVC is on the top left and your main PA is in the middle with the right PA coming across the, uh, behind the ascending artery. And you can see there's a, sample, a saddle embolus popping in and out of your main PA into your right PA, okay? Um, there's an international registry for P, and they, they, they assess it mostly in the US actually, although it's international. And they re reckon that the pickup rate using transthoracic for visualizing an embolus is only 4%. TOE is better, but the studies that have been performed have been used in small groups and focused on patients who they already knew had evidence of right, uh, right uh, ventricular strain. And so even with TOE, the most distal bit we can see is the right PA, right main pulmonary artery, and we can't even see the left pulmonary artery because the trachea gets in the way. So in these cases, a pro such a proximal P, these patients are often very high hemodynamically unstable or have arrested already. And so if a thrombus is not seen, what signs can we use to diagnose PE? And in these cases, all we see are indirect signs that are present that demonstrate RV, RV strain, such as acute pulmonary hypertension, RV dilatation dysfunction, interventricular septal shift. And, but the problem with this is that many of these signs are seen in other con uh, conditions such as RV infarct or uh, the, um, acute mitral regurgitation or uh, acute valvular dis dysfunction, either stenosis or regurgitation. So many signs of acute P have been demonstrated and assessed. There are three ones that everyone talks about, which is RV and low overload, McConnell sign and 6060 sign. I'm not going to talk about it, but I'll tell you actually the evidence for them individually is that none of them are sensitive or specific enough. Even if you combine the three signs, um, not, they're really of insufficient strength to be diagnostic of PE. And so what's the point of echoing these patients? Actually, what's more important of, of, about echoing these patients is to rule out co other causes, potential causes that may mimic PE. And also it's very, very good at risk stratification where there's signs of RV injury, presence of right heart thrombi or a PFO, there's a, it, it increases patient mortality between two and 4%. The other thing it's good for is to monitor the response to therapy, all right? But you have to realize the RV will not return back to its normal function for many months. Um, and, and the reason is purely because of the anatomy. The LV is muscular, dense, and resistant to change like a bagel, whereas, just, whereas the RV is, is, is like a croissant. It's thin-walled and delicate. 
So finally, let's talk about using echo to assess fluid status in critically ill patients. Straight off the bat, the current evidence is, is does not support its use in spontaneously breathing patients. So that's why on our courses, we, we tend not to, uh, we, we, we get you to scan the IVC, but we tend to not, not use it as a, a main way to assess filling or patient uh, fluid status. So the evidence for ventilation, the ventilated patients is slightly more helpful, but a huge number of patients fall in the massive gray area between the two extreme ends of the spectrum. So if you've got a small IVC, less than 1.3 centimeters, it predicts that you're probably fluid responsive rather than uh, underfilled, okay? And if it's more than 2.5 centimeters, then you're likely to be fluid non, a non-fluid responder. Same thing with your variability. So you're looking at distensibility and positively pressure ventilated patients. So if you've got variability of 18% or, or a variability of less than 3%, it, it also predicts if you're a fluid responder or a non-responder. The problem with that is that ventilated patients, depending on how much pressure you've got, will have a dilated IVC, and this actually might not reflect your fluid status. And also, if you, depending on how you scan the IVC, so the, for the FICE, you always are asked to scan the IVC in long access. But actually, if you can see, if you scan the edge of the IVC, such as this red image, it may make you uh, falsely reassure that the IVC is small and collapsible. So we would suggest probably scan the IVC short access rather than long access, but it's not part of uh, Fusic CART. There's a good article about um, the, the ultrasound assessment of the IVC by Scott Militant. Take a look at it, have a read, and it might uh, 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 change your idea of using the IVC as a uh, method of assessing fluid. So what is the echo not useful? And um, the other thing is we there's a huge drive towards sort of assessing LV diastology. LV diastology. <clears throat> so you ask why is that important? Because actually in the community, more people are being diagnosed with HEFPEF, which is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus Populated with a reduced ejection fraction. So diastolic dysfunction versus systolic dysfunction. Although the two different pathologies, they have both have similar rate and frequency of hospitalizations and both have very, uh, the similar symptomatic status or other quality of life indicators. In terms of mortality, hospital patients have shown mortality rates similar between HEFPEF and HEFREF. But if you include community-based studies, there's a slightly lower uh, mortality with patients with diastolic dysfunction. And also there's growing evidence that LV diastolic dysfunction in ICU patients equals worse outcome. It's actually quite fairly easy to measure. There's lots of you know clear guidance of how to diagnose diastolic dysfunction. It is theoretically useful, but the problem is in the critically ill, there's a huge number of changes in your loading conditions. For example, sepsis drops your SVR, affects your LV and right ventricular contractility, pre-hospital dehydration drops your preload, hypoxia increases your P PVR. So in reality, these measures are not ap applicable to the critically ill. In addition, the effect of positive pressure ventilation is not negligible either. A study on cardiac surgery patients demonstrated that increasing P changes your assessment of diastolic dysfunction and actually makes your numbers look worse. So I don't find it useful at all, unless you're at extremes of diastolic dysfunction. For example, if you've got severe diastolic dysfunction, which is fixed, um, your mortality is quite high. So I'm about, I'm almost there, almost near the end. So how I do critical care echo, and everyone has their opinion about critical care echo. So I'm always do a full life scan, uh, full life um, level two scan of the heart. Um, a lot of my colleagues will do that in theater and in ICU, but actually, if you look at the evidence, and and um, much of our data is actually derived from cardiology patients who are by definition stable outpatients. There is no, there's very little evidence that the numbers used in cardiology is applicable to the critical ill. 
So combining this with the evidence I've shown you so far, so what's the point of ECHO? So for those that know me, I almost purely use ECHO as a contractility monitor or pump monitor. So looking at squeeze, SAC, squeeze, and strain. So in terms of SAC, is there a significant pericardial fusion? In terms of squeeze, is there a problem with contractility? And then in terms of strain, is there RV failure? Is there valvular abnormalities causing, causing strain on the heart? So if there is a pump problem, you need to be able to compare this with a patient's baseline heart function, okay? And the reality is that most patients will have not had an echo before. And the second point is to treat the patient, not the echo. Don't be like that uh, orthopedic surgeon. There's a fracture, I need to fix it. Or the LB is poor, I must start inotropes. Because actually, if there's evidence of adequate end organ perfusion, I wouldn't necessarily treat the patient with inotropes or basal pressures. Okay, so this is my simple flow chart. For me, is there a pump problem? Is the problem the sac, the squeeze, or the strain? Okay. Next step is can I solve the problem? Or do I need help from the uh, cardiologists, cardiac surgeons? Apply the therapy. So in terms of SAC, drain the fusion. In terms of squeeze, start inotropes. Is a strain um, um, reduce, for example, reduce the after of the LV or have a chart with the cardiac surgeons or cardiologists to see if they can uh, facilitate anything to reduce the strain on the heart. And the key thing that I find we don't do often enough is repeat the echo after the intervention then. I wouldn't do it immediately. I'll probably do it in the next 12 and 24 hours after the intervention is being applied to a patient. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to talk about briefly about is there's loads of research over the last few decades that's been focused on identifying and managing LV failure, but little has been done about RV failure. And given the anatomy and physiology of the RV, which I've talked about, is very thick. And it's very fragile. It is at most more risk of injury. And pro, th this group, which is the Pro RV Net group, was formed from the mind of Vas Vas Vasilos which is one of our ACMO consultants. And we uh, put together this group to look at more um, assessing, the, taking a look at the research associated with the RV and, and sort of identify early signs of RV failure. Because by the time a patient hits ICU. And there's signs of RV injury. Often, it is too late to reverse the the strain on the heart. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So, any questions? Adela is one of our trainees who's at Glenfield Hospital at the moment. Um, she's going to present a uh, paper on. I think. Well, I let her introduce the the paper. It's echo and related to outcomes in ICU? Uh, so I'm one of the anesthetic um, uh, registrars and um, today uh, I want to uh, present you an article um, that was published in March 2022 in uh, Journal of Critical Care. Um, and um, this article is about um, early echo um, in the critically ill patients. Um, and is trying to see whether there's an, um, um, any linkage between performing early echo and improved outcome on one year after ICU uh, discharge. Um, just a bit um, of a, a background. Um, I know uh, Dr. Lau has already mentioned that there's a lot of limitations um, in interpretation of echo results. Uh, but it's still very, very popular and we use it uh, as much as we can to our best knowledge um, as a screening, diagnostic and hemodynamic tool in intensive care. Um, and there are several studies that have shown that echo can be beneficial um, in patients with primary cardiac uh, disease, uh, but also in other patients admitted to intensive care uh, that have hemodynamic um, instability. Um, I'm just going to uh, jump and not mention this meta-analysis. Uh, the only uh, important bit is that um, there ha have been guidelines uh, published um, uh, by the um, 
uh, European um, Society of ICM uh, American Heart uh, Association that recommend an early echo to be performed um, in hemodynamically unstable patients um, on admission to uh, intensive care. Um, there's too many computers around me. And um, even though um, several meta-analyses uh, have looked at um, echoes and uh, how to improve the management in intensive care, there are very few um, studies that have actually looked at um, um, echo and um, outcome at uh, ICU discharge or later on down the line. Um, in terms of methods, um, this is an ancillary analysis from Frog ICU. And for uh, people that are not familiarized with this um, uh, study, um, and I'm just going to mention few uh, few data about it. Um, Frog ICU was a prospective observational uh, multi-center cohort study of ICU survivors followed one year after discharge. It included quite a lot of ICUs across uh, France and uh, Belgium. Um, and this study um, has been developed uh, because, as, as we know, um, survivors of uh, intensive care face of a period of increased risk of uh, reduced long-term survival and impaired quality of life uh, because of PTSD, cognitive impairment, uh, physical weakness. And what this study uh, tried to um, find out uh, was, um, can, can we find any clinical and biological markers uh, prior to patient's discharge that would um, uh, pick up those most vulnerable patients, the patients that are at high risk of um, having a poor outcome um, after ICU discharge. Um, and um, they've, they've collected a, a lot of data about those patients. They had a huge number of patients recruited for this uh, study. And their main outcome was uh, to look at the all-cause mortality at one year after ICU discharge. And the secondary outcome is to pick up those clinical and biological markers. In terms of clinical markers, um, it was quite interesting because they looked at patients that um, had signs of inflammation, had a lower uh, baseline a lower blood pressure um, and a residual organ dysfunction uh, prior to ICU discharge. And uh, the biological markers they picked for, um, they looked at pro-BNP, obviously as a, as a sign of cardiac congestion, uh, troponin as a sign of cardiac uh, injury, bioactive adrenomedulin, um, as a sign of vascular um, endothelial dysfunction and uh, soluble uh, ST2, um, which, oh, hold on, sorry. Um, sorry, I just lost my, um, okay. And um, th the other one, which is a uh, sign of cardiac remodeling. Um, and their study uh, basic, basically showed that um, the overall mortality uh, post ICU discharge um, was around 20%, uh, which is in keeping with uh, the other data published in uh, literature. But also they've managed to identify clinical and biological factors that um, um, sort of help detecting those most vulnerable patients. Um, so, for example, patients that had uh, lower baseline blood pressure, uh, patients that required a prolonged uh, organ uh, support during their ICU stay, patients that had markers of inflammation such as high platelets or temperature on discharge, um, had a poorer outcome. Also, patients that uh, had um, severities caused um, on admission um, also, 
looking at those biological markers, apart from TNT, all the other three uh, quite interestingly show that these patients can have a, a poorer outcome on um, after a year of discharge. Um, so it, the idea is that frog ICU um, show, helped um, with this huge database from which lots of ancillary studies have further developed. Some of them looked at sepsis, some of them looked at trauma patients, and um, our current study looked at the uh, effects of ECHO on uh, overall outcome. Therefore, um, the patients, the participants of the studies were basically the frog ICU uh, patients. Um, and that means all the patients that uh, were admitted to intensive care uh, needing mechanical ventilation and uh, inotrope support uh, for more than 24 hours. Um, and the exclusion criteria you can uh, you can see it's, it's presented there. Uh, what the current study uh, added to the exclusions criteria is death during the first three days of uh, intensive care. Reason being, um, the, the patients, um, you couldn't have um, performed this study um, because they needed the patients that had echoes in the first three days of admission as an inclusion criteria. Um, okay, so um, the, the, the current study um, divided the population into two groups, is the echo group and the non-echo group. Um, of the 1,359 1, patients admitted to centres where echo was available, 372 patients underwent echo in the first three days. Uh, if we look here, the non-echo group is it's far uh, larger than uh, the first one. Uh, we'll, we'll just skip that. It just shows uh, what the characteristics of the of the groups uh, were. Uh, there were some similarities in terms of uh, comorbidity uh, burden, demographics of the patients, even some of the um, clinical and biological criteria on discharge. But what is interesting is um, that they actually managed to pick up some differences between the patients that had an echo and the ones that didn't. And the patients that had an echo had higher uh, SAPS2 scores uh, on ICU admission, which is uh, one of the intensive care scores assessing mortality. Uh, they had high TNTs and high pro-BNP on uh, admission and their median left ventricle ejection fraction was around uh, 51%. Uh, um, what they managed to do is um, subgroup uh, analysis according to etiologies and they sort of try to divide the echo and the non-echo groups into patients um, with cardiac disease, with um, um, sepsis, neurological disorder, respiratory failure, and other causes that brought them to um, intensive care. And um, of the, uh, if you look here, of the ICU patients admitted with cardiac disease, almost half of them underwent uh, echo. And these patients had by far the lowest cardiac output uh, compared to the rest of the etiologies, which was uh, uh, statistically significant. Um, their primary outcome was uh, to assess the association between the use of echo within three days of ICU admission and one-year-old cause uh, mortality. And um, to be honest, um, the difference between the echo and the non-echo group was um, statistically insignificant. The secondary outcome of the study was to see whether there was an association between early echo and um, in ICU mortality, so uh, patients still admitted to intensive care when they uh, expired. Um, and the result was uh, similar to the primary outcome. There wasn't a big difference between the two uh, groups. What was sort of interesting, uh, it showed that um, 
if we took uh, each subgroup uh, bit by bit, um, the um, analysis showed some survival benefit uh, for ICU patients with cardiac disease in whom an echo was performed early on uh, after admission. I mean, I'm not quite sure what this represents. Um, is it um, because an early echo means um, early targeted therapy? That, that's the choice of the adequate management that these patients require. Uh, what these, how many of these patients were actually post um, cardiac surgery? Um, and also, um, if, if a patient has primary cardiac disease uh, and echo primarily looks at cardiac function, uh, then you would sort of think they would uh, be the subgroup of people that would most benefit from uh, an echo. Um, so in terms of authors' um, conclusions, ECHO showed marked alteration in heart contraction in ICU patients admitted for cardiac disease, which is sort of expected, um, but also showed survival benefit in these patients, which made them hypothesize that an early ECHO can be useful for diagnosis and for targeted therapy, and this might actually um, have an impact on survival, but um, it did not show any so statistical significance um, in terms of early echo um, for overall um, survival. Um, it, in terms of strengths of this uh, study, um, I mean, I guess they've used that huge database um, and they managed to recruit enough patients for their study. Um, the patients that were um, recruited for frog ICU had a very thorough uh, assessment on admission during ICU stay and at discharge. So it actually sort of helped having an accurate and complex picture of each of the patients admitted um, to, into this study. Um, uh, however, there is a huge difference between the numbers of um, the patients that belong to the ECHO and non-ECHO group. Um, and um, I'm not quite sure how many of them uh, were cardiac post-surgery, because I think it's sort of different if uh, compared to um, patients coming into medical ICUs with cardiac uh, uh, diseases. Um, Again, it's uh, one of the biggest limitations of this study. It's, it's a non-randomized study. So the observational nature of the data prevents confirming causality. Um, it's, it's really difficult to ask an ICU doctor um, to randomize critically ill patients with unstable hemodynamics to undergo echo versus echo. So it, it couldn't have been done. Um, it was an observational study and we just had to um, uh, sort of interpret the data that this observational study offered us. Um, also, the patients that had echo, according to their findings, were sicker. Um, so it wasn't a, a balanced sort of two groups of uh, patients. Um, so the number of echoes um, uh, that uh, it wasn't mentioned if uh, echo was done on a one-off base or it was serial echoes and they haven't uh, mentioned if the echoes were done uh, by the same uh, physician or um, different physicians because as Dr. Lau already mentioned there is um, a, a variability in terms of interpretation of the of the results um, and we don't know why ECHO was performed. Um, was it for diagnosis? Was it to guide treatment? If the ECHO was performed, was prompted any treatment? We're not quite sure about that. Um, for the non-ECHO group, um, ECHO um, was performed later in some of the patients. So after three days of uh, ICU admission. Uh, and if these patients actually benefited from an echo, they, um, the results may have been biased towards no difference. In the non, some of the non-echo non groups, um, some of the patients from the non-echo group received 
early hemodynamic monitoring instead of echo, and if these patients actually had a targeted management and had um, a useful intervention from the hem hemodynamic monitoring, that actually might have underestimated the um, effects of echo in the echo group patients. Um, they didn't say which echo parameters uh, had the greatest impact uh, in terms of correlation with outcome. They've done lots of, they've measured lots of parameters, but they didn't say which one was most helpful. Um, and so, basically, the conclusion is that um, in critically ill patients admitted to ICU or LECO, uh, was not associated with short or long term survival. And there might be some um, benefit from um, performing echo in patients with cardiac disease, which inference we sort of knew already. So the question is if this uh, article would change our management. Um, I'm just going to let the answer the experts to answer this question, but um, in my opinion, we we are currently work at Glenfit Hospital and we are in a very good position uh, where TOE and TT experts work and we have uh, ECHO on, available anytime um, and we do perform uh, ECHOs uh, in most of our patients. So I don't think we can actually change our practice because we are already doing that and if I don't, uh, if echo is not performed in one of the critical care units, I don't think it's because people don't think of doing it, it's just because of lack of trained people. Um, so yeah, it's difficult to see how this article would actually change uh, management of what we are doing currently. Um, yeah, so this is everything I wanted to say. Uh, if there are any questions, Yeah. Hello. Yeah. I uh, just want to know when this study was done. What what year was it? Um. So the the Frog ICU collected uh data patient. I think it started in 2010 and ended in 2012, and this study was published in 2022. Thank you. Um. Okay. So I think that's uh, things done about there. Um. The feedback code is in the chat. Uh, if you could kindly kindly scan that that'd be really helpful um, and then otherwise we will we'll see you all next week thanks very much everyone thank you thank you